I was expecting more of a room where we would be all sitting together and, and, and talking than, than this one. Um, I think essentially, as a plan for today, um, I think we, we want to kind of like summarize a bunch of like the tests and discussions that happened uh, during the past uh, few days in this conference and, and before and before this. Um, from the kernel side perspective, like we are, we are pretty happy with uh, everything that, uh, that that happened so far. Like we've been in a few sessions and in, 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 in talks and how we discussions and so on. We are seeing like a lot of the community uh, uh, talking more and more about like continuous integration on the kernel, more, more tests about like uh, how we and now, and now the problems in there, right? That um, uh, the, the, the architecture that we have like is, is is super complex, like from figuring out how you do your labs or your cloud infrastructure for the test into which CI systems you're, you're throwing to it, how you set up your CI systems, uh, which different tools and, 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 and things and tests and test suites, et cetera, that we are putting together and, and how to figure out which test to test um, in each scenario for each platform, for each subsystem and so on and how to visualize that data like we've been we've been looking into all that during this week and i think it's a it's a, a lot of progress like we were just like in a room um this afternoon with like 20 30 people discussing a bunch of those topics and yesterday as well and uh, there was a nice group of people in a happy hour yesterday so i think for today i want to see which other things uh we should be like which other things that were not raised yet uh, that people want to, to bring us questions to, to this. Um, maybe there is like another use case or maybe someone else want to bring like a summary uh, of, of, of what they saw uh, during these uh, past three days on this. Helen, maybe? Uh, yes. Uh, so one thing. Oh, let me see. One thing that. Um, so a summary would be we had lots of discussions about maintainers workflow, about different test suites, and uh, how can we, as you mentioned, how can we define all the tests uh, to know when to run, how we can trust the test. But one thing that I am missing. Uh, so I see several people around tests discussing. Um, but one thing that I like to see more is uh, maintainers to come to us uh, and understand how we can help you as a maintainer uh, to, so, so you can rely on the tests there, which kind of tests, which kind of data you want to see. So I was wondering if there is any maintainer here who would like to, to speak to, so we can understand how you do testing, how we can help you in general. Either Ted, Kevin, who else is mounting? I'm already bugging you. So. Yeah, you're bugging me. <laughs> yeah. Any? Ted, Ted explain to us. Uh, Ted had a The mic, yeah. Hi, Ted. <laughs> uh, you explained to us uh, what, what you like to do when we tried the um, test catalog effort in the maintainers file. Uh, in short, uh, you're running XFS tests, right? In virtual machines, you have special um, tool for spinning up the machine and run them in Azure. Is that no. yeah? Yeah, I mean, I mean yeah. So uh, I have a test framework. It's called GCE XFS tests. It's built on top of XFS uh, tests. It uses the Google Compute Engine. I think speaking more generally, all of the file system developers are using XFS tests. We generally are running a large number of different file system configurations. So 4K block size, 1K block size, you know, different size inodes. Um, I have something like a dozen different uh, configurations just for EXT4. Uh, there's probably a little bit over a dozen that we run for XFS tests, um, uh, for XFS. And so as a result, uh, there are roughly speaking something like 1,100 odd tests for a particular file system configuration and, uh, you know, 
I am currently running uh, using FS Next, which is a subset of Linux Next. Um, and so I am kicking off something like about 28 different VMs running 28 different file system configs for ext4, xfs, f2fs, and butterfs. Um, wall clock time, it takes about uh, four hours, plus or minus. Um, and as I said, that there's like close to 30 different VMs. So it's quite a lot of compute time. Fortunately, I have access to a lot of compute time. Um, the bigger issue is it's a very, very large number of test results. Um, and the challenge that I think all of the file system developers have is analyzing the test results to find which of the tests are failing. Are they failing across multiple file systems or is it just exclusive to one file system? Uh, finding flaky tests, of uh, you know, noting regressions, uh, and of course the other issue is XFS tests uses uh, JUnit XML as opposed to the KUnit um, test report language, which uh, you know many things like KSelf tests use uh, and KUnits use. So there's that issue as well. Um, I think. We actually all have our own test infrastructure already, and many of us have access to uh, the resources to run it. The big missing piece is the visualization and, and analysis. Uh, and that might be an interesting thing um, to work with Kernel CI with. Uh, I think a number of us are already set up so that we have, you know, every night, this, these 30 odd VMs that we're running, it's like a six or 700K XML file with, you know, literally thousands of test results for one night, all right? And it's against FS Next, so FS Next is currently, you know, it's constantly changing. Um, I would be happy to send that XML file to someone who wanted to consume it and do something interesting with it. There's certainly nothing secret in it. Uh, I think different file system developers would love if they could send their XML files as well to some central collection point that could then do something useful for the benefit of the entire community. Um, and so I think that's the, the challenge is, you know, we've got this environment. It's a little bit different from the traditional, um, you know, testing that KCI has done in the past. How can we work together? So. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Red Hat also runs XFS tests, and I suppose others run XFS tests. And Red Hat already submits their results to KCIDB, but they are not detailed enough. So KCIDB would be happy to get your test results, so because you have a lot of resources, that would be awesome. And we can work with you on trying to make sense of that data and accommodate your specific requirements in KCIDB. Uh, the only problem is that we need, like, um, we need like, to manage access control, so not so the results needs to be submitted from 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 an entity that we tr we can trust and give the keys to. Yeah. So if it's for your setup, for example, or a specific maintainer, but we cannot take it like from all maintainers if they are running it yeah, separately, because yeah. we cannot manage that kind of uh, access control. Yeah. So. Um, how many of those tests are performance measurement tests? They are nearly all functional tests. Okay, that's good. Because we do have support for performance tests, but like a story of how to, how to process them is not developed at all yet. We have the same problem. Yeah. I, I can run the Pharonix test suite, which is what I've been using to get performance results, but it's manual and comparison of the results is totally manual. Have you so, seen teams talk about trying to accommodate uh, performance results in KTAP? I've seen some of those discussions, but okay. I haven't followed them actively. Well, basically, it's, it's yeah. a, he developed a tool to have reference values, have criteria, and do that in like, you know, using files in your local file system. Yeah. But we will have to do something similar in KCIDB as well, mm -hmm. and maybe you can use that. <coughs> 
Okay. Um, yeah, and, yes. and and I think like stepping back a bit and look like into like there is the place where KCDB is today and the kernel cell infrastructure is today and there is what we can develop together. Like so, having the data land into KCDB from you and from Red Hat and from other people who are contributing to XFS tests will allow us to have the proper feedback into how to put together the dashboard and and KCDB, which is the the, sec the second part in the, into the diagram there is developing more and more strategies for post-processing the data. So you might have a lot of strategies yourself already, but uh, we could bring that in and uh, everyone can benefit from that. So that's kind of the ecosystem we're trying to put together here. Yeah, and the general approach of KCIDB is get data first and figure out what to do with it. <laughs> uh, and repeat, basically. Yes? Uh, yeah, so if you want to start submitting your data to KCIDB, we have people that can help you, so let us know. Yeah, uh, I think yeah. Uh, Nikolai can provide the, the yeah, uh, provide uh, access, and we have uh, Jenny in our side that already do this bridge in Maestro that can help you. Yeah. And once data is there, um, I can help you with the visualization. We can build specific boards, uh, dashboards, so uh, to help analyze this data as well. And we can also add some uh, post-processing uh, code there to figure out the issues, uh, so you can have um, extract what the data, what, what, which kind of data you need to really care about and, and go fix. Yeah, I think I think you and I discussed it before that uh, the first community was developed at JUnity. Uh, standard for, for the test results on the XFS test? Because that would be easy to just, like, we can translate that format into the KCIDB format, which is a DB schema, and everyone could just use that. Yeah, so we've just simply been using the J unit, that's, you know, industry standard test results, mm -hmm. uh, because that's what XFS tests had introduced many, many, many years ago. Okay. Uh, so we've been just using that because that's what um, uh, that's what XFS test does. We have extended it, but we're using the XML style of extension uh, in terms of uh, we actually tag the results with exactly what version of FIO of XFS tests of the kernel. So we have a lot of inform test metadata about the test environment that we have put into the XML file, but we're using XML attributes, so we didn't really extend the test format as much as took advantage of the facilities that um, the JUnit XML standard has. I think that's actually one of those interesting limitations. I've been talking to um, some of the folks about you know how KTAP might be extended because it would be really, really useful if there was a way that we could do lossless interchange between the KTAP format and the JUnit um, format, because right now, you know, KTAP was designed to be simple, uh, and so what you can put in KTAP is a subset of what you can put in the JUnit XML, um, but that could be changed, and I know the KTAP people have been looking at enhancing that metadata because you want that, I suspect, for, KC, uh, for the KCIDB. Well, we have a K KTAP specialist yeah. over there. I hope I can throw this well enough. <laughs> In steps, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I gave a talk on this um, earlier on wanting to create a common KTAP library. And part of that is I want to create a converter from KTAP to JUnit XML because I know XFS tests really inspired that actually. Um, and if we're doing a converter one way, I don't see why we couldn't do it the other way as well from JUnit XML to KTAP. So if that helps um, expedite your process to uploading these results to KCIDB or something or um, using other KTAP tooling, definitely open to that. The only issue is the metadata. Um, I do have the KTAP metadata proposal up for KTAP version 2, which is pretty exhaustive and is somewhat based off of the XFS test attributes, um, actually. So there should be a decent amount of overlap. Um, but I'm definitely happy to keep working with you on it to make it even closer. Yeah. OK. Sounds good. Should we move on? Maybe. Maybe you want to give a uh, summary of the test catalog discussion so far? Yeah, you were quite involved in it, yeah. 
can you can, you can, you can okay. take this thing. Oh. <laughs> yeah, right. I forgot. <laughs> so uh, we had we just had this discussion, right? And some of you were there. So um, there is idea to have the test catalog for upstream. Basically, what maintainers would like would like to see tested before they would accept contributions. Simply speaking, right? So the idea is that the maintainers control which tests go there, and CI systems figure out what data they need about the tests so they can execute them automatically. It's a way to standardize, like, <coughs> like for contributors to figure out what to execute, and for CI systems also to know what maintainers care about so they can actually execute it. Uh, there was a lot of interest and a lot of discussion, a lot of suggestions. We're going to start simple. We take some simple tests that we, can, we know we can execute, not like you know some some really wild tests that need multi-host setup, specific, very specific. And we start from that. Uh, we start a discussion on the mail lists uh, about the format, and we take it from there. Basically, it's going to be the file will be somewhere on kernelci.org for the start, while we figure out the basics. At some point, we will uh, try, try to contribute it to the kernel. When we have more or less functionality, we will try to develop the tool that lets you actually run those tests from that catalog as soon as possible, because I think it's important for the feedback loop. Uh, and um, yeah, we'll take it from there and try to you know talk to maintainers, uh, try to put those tools in there, ramp up the functionality of CI systems in that tool for execution. Like, whatever is needed. Any questions? Wonderful. OK. <laughs> no, no, no questions. Great. I guess it could go like sooner. There is a good time discussion. OK, you want to say something about like a summarizing what happened for you in the conference? Happy to. Yeah, so on a K unit and, and KTAP front, uh, we've uh, spent some time this morning discussing whether we want K unit tests to be able to run entirely as user space tests or have a user space version of K unit. Um, I think everyone thought it was a good idea um, and that we should do the simplest possible thing, which, you know, has already been experimented with by various people of let's have a header that implements you know, the basic k-unit um, macros, assertions, et cetera, so that if you have something that's sufficiently self-contained, um, you can not only build it as an in-kernel test, but you can also build it as a standalone binary and uh, then be able to you know, send that to the compiler vendor as a repro test case or not have to build the entire kernel to test your change. Um, <coughs> while you're developing it. Um, there are some interesting uh, comments around uh, particularly tests involving lots of threads. KUnit's not great at those in the kernel. Uh, there are ways around that um, in user space for people who want to do user space only tests. Uh, this might also be useful for um, tools in the, uh, the testing, in the, the kernel tree like Perf, uh, potentially some of the build tools, we'll see. Uh, seems like a great idea. Everyone likes it, so we'll uh, see where that goes. Um, yeah. To be honest, I was thinking, I, I thought that KUnit already does that. It sort <laughs> of does through user mode Linux, but user mode Linux, in, for all of the problems it solves, it introduces a corresponding one. So um, it's great to uh, have multiple ways of attacking this problem with different sets of trade-offs. Cool. Thank you. I kind of, since someone brought up UML, uh, I want to just quickly say something about, like, I kind of wish one of the things we could do is build the various subsystems, components, files, whatever we want to call this, um, that are in the Linux kernel as 
user space modules that we can just control the inputs and outputs and actually test individually because building the whole kernel thingy and then having to do all the stuff is quite a bit harder than if we could just isolate a component and do that like you know I, i'm somewhat involved in butterfs and and to a lesser extent bcashfs and like this is sort of a thing that has been kind of a point of discussion is that well, it would be super nice if, you know, one of the things that we started taking away from this was instead of thinking of having to always do integration style unit testing, which is what we basically do right now, is start looking at whether we can start isolating these pieces and being able to build them in alone to be able to test them in isolation, because that makes it much easier to determine where the boundary of faults are when trying to fix bugs or deal with um, progressions and things of that nature, because you can figure out where the boundary is for what causes a regression or what's, what's created a problem or what the interface um, impedance mismatch has created an issue from. Um, like a few years ago, I had seen something called LKL or the Linux kernel library project. That was something that I was kind of interested in seeing whether anyone had had any experience with looking at from the perspective of being able to kind of bring that into mainline and use that for enhancing the quality of testing. So uh, I was going to, to mention LKL. Uh, it's something certainly that uh, we've looked at. It is at the moment basically just UML. So, um, you know, you don't actually split the, the subsystems off totally, um, but you do get sort of in user space. Uh, it's not totally different from uh, what KUnit's doing in some respects, um, has some advantages. Actually refactoring the entire kernel to, to split things up uh, would be amazing, um, but I'm not going to guarantee I'll do the work. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying that you would or, or anyone else would, but like I feel like one of the things that kind of inhibits that natural progression for doing it, either from contributors or maintainers or whatever, is the fact that we just don't have an apparatus in the first place that kind of encourages people to do that. It's just not really a thing, and it's really easy to just do quite the opposite in in the Linux in the Linux code base. Yeah. Well, hopefully. Uh... Hopefully this is a path we can start to go down more. There are now a few uh, smaller parts of the kernel that are buildable independently, but it's you know um, a few bits of data structure manipulation here, you know a header there rather than any you know really substantial subsystems. It's a start. Yeah, perhaps this could be the way like convert and uh, make make pieces of the kernel built outside uh, not not in context of context of the kernel as needed uh, hello I just want to share that um, for the Rust block layer uh, bindings, we have also built a CI, yet another one. Um, uh, we had the uh, requirement that we wanted to, so this is not, a, uh, this is not as much a um, unit testing CI as it is a performance testing CI to um, test uh, performance regressions. And we wanted these tests to run on bare metal uh, in a little cluster we have uh, somewhere. And for that, we, we have built a thing. It uses uh, NICs to, if you have a number of uh, hardware nodes that you want to bring up into a certain state without having them stateful, so like without having a distro or like something on them, there's, there, we have uh, some tools that can, uh, <laughs> via IPixy, bring the nodes up, run your tests, deliver the test output back to some place it can be collected. And um, we have a little, uh, like a resource queue manager to do that. It's all like very bespoke and built for us. But if anyone is interested in that or have a similar um, use case, we can come talk to me and then we can share it and make it open source. And, 
Yeah, the part about Nix is interesting. The cool thing is it, it allows you to have your workers completely stateless. The only thing, the only state on them is the IPXE bootloader, which you can provide via USB stick or put it like on the um, ROM of your net card, network card or something. And then um, what you do is you write a Nix expression and the system will um, bring that node up into the uh, configuration described by that expression, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah if you, I'm here, so if you want any details, you can just. Yes, thank you. Helen, you had something? Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to summarize a bit uh, some of the discussions that I've had. Um, so regarding uh, KCIDB, we discussed it um, about like processing data and how we can extract uh, useful information from that. So we discussed one approach with AI that looks very promising. Um, let's see how it goes. Uh, uh, so in also regarding other CI systems, so I had discussions about media CI and DRM CI, uh, everyone is doing their own CI, but we are trying to converge and, and reuse things. Uh, so uh, the free desktop maintainers came and uh, showed their concerns about overloading their infrastructure, so that was an interesting discussion as well. Um, what else that I can say? Uh, we also had interesting discussions regarding uh, how we can manage uh, access, um, at which point, so everyone should be able to run their CI, like pre-merge in any patch, or would these overload the system and also cause a security issue because we would allow uh, anyone to execute anything. Uh, another, so this is one model, another model is like post-merge, tests or another model is something in between like post review uh, tests. So there are different kind of models and uh, we need to figure out um, how to manage. Uh, and another interesting discussion was, um, so someone raised that it would be interesting the possibility to have access, direct access to a remote board uh, to the bug that you don't own this board, and, but this is also complicated. Uh, so maybe this could be some arrangement between like the, the, the maintainer and the lab. Um, so yeah, just wanted to share a few discussions uh, that I had that were interesting. Yes, thank you. Yes, th th those, those were interesting. And the, another part was that um, the job of kernel CI could be arbitrating those contacts between the maintainers of the labs and the maintainers of the kernel and act as like a, as, as, as a communication hub for them to figure out what they need, what they want. And the point was also that both sides should have control over what is running where. So the uh, lab owners should have control which tests they want to run, which architectures, whatever, what, what they would prefer on their lab and the maintainers should have control where the tests that they care about should run. So like if they don't care about particular board, they, sh they should be able to exclude it from the pool that, that they receive results from because it, they don't want to care about it, they have no capacity. So it's, it's just a sort of like a, like a market of <laughs> hardware <laughs> being kernel CI. And the point of the Access control and the uh, abuse of CI resources is, is an eternal one. It's, everybody is struggling with it, yes, and there, there was the discussion with the typical arguments that what if somebody mines bitcoins, which happens, what if somebody uh, you know, just accidentally breaks something or whatever. So yes, the, there are multiple ways to deal with that, and I think that ultimately each team will, like, will have to figure it out according to the way they like to work. Some people might want to know, never run CI before the review. Some people might allow some minimal tests in a secure environment to run like for everybody so they get immediate value, immediate feedback faster. So yeah, but it's, a, it's an eternal problem. Yeah, another perspective into this is that um, kernel CI 
beyond being like a, a, a project, open source project, like with infrastructure and so on, it's also a legal entity under the, the Linux Foundation. So we can take responsibility for the resources that people want to share with current developers. We can mediate uh, a bunch of that. So maintainers can benefit from that service on kernel CI as well. Like, oh, I need access to certain cer to certain amount of like uh, cloud resources or certain boards and so on. We can figure out ways to make that happen. Not, of, not all the times we, we, we will succeed, but uh, the, the, the entity is there to also work on those like more uh, boring stuff. Yeah, and sometimes figure or be flexible and figure out what we can do. And I think that's gonna, you know, we, we might not think about something supporting some use case, but we are there to make it happen somehow for you. Really? All right. Um, so about that uh, part about kernel CI being the arbitrator for that whole exchange, um, would kernel CI then also be responsible for making sure that the things scale properly? To the amount of our financing. Join the foundation. <laughs> I, I think I'm, I already am as I am <laughs> at Collabora, but uh, yeah, so, <laughs> but I, like I, I, I think that's just an interesting problem. Like uh, when when the usage on a CI system like rises, like how do you handle that? Because, like, I mean, in some cases it's even impossible. If you have a device which is basically out of the market, you can't just get more of that, and so then you have to basically make sure that you share the device properly. Yeah, you and can then, probably try eBay. Uh, yeah, if it's still, <laughs> but I, I think you get the point. Like, I I, I feel like um, scaling these uh, like labs properly and making sure that you share them in the right amount is, is pretty hard. And uh, and I just wanted to know whether Kernel CI uh, like wants to take care of that or not. That's that's our function. Yes, we have some resources. We should be responsible and you know make sure that people who need support who need that. You know we, that we share them fairly, and arbitrate all the discussions. Like, why am I get? Why I'm not getting those resources, and that guy gets those resources. So, yeah. And there's a way that we can kind of filter how much workload we send to the labs, um, moving things even further left. Like having people contributors running the CI basically on their machines. I was talking to Guillaume earlier, and like he has an idea of using hooks. Uh, which might be a way to, like, if, when you're pushing your things, you can run a basic uh, CI on your machine using virtualization, maybe, because there's a lot of the kernel that you can probably test just using virtualized stuff, which clearly doesn't require labs. And then we can be sure that we only send to labs things that are almost pristine, and, well, that might be a way to, to save resources. A way to further improve the situation will be if vendors will just make uh, open simulators for things. That will solve the entire problem. And in that sense, uh, when I worked on hardware, which was very lightweight, let's say, uh, I started from the, the spec and the simulator and then went to develop the, the other things. So I don't understand why they don't make that first and make it available before the hardware. Well, this, there's probably a lot of uh, you know se secret knowledge about those emulators and secret technology that they that you can just you know have a license to run this emulator some, anywhere you want. But what kind of performance were you getting of the, out of those simulators? Uh, in my case, it didn't matter much because it was about compliance. But basically, everything was designed so that the hardware will perform about the same as the software implementation in the ways I care about. Uh, of course, it will be a little bit faster, but it didn't matter much <coughs> to me. Well, this, this could be something to explore and ask some vendors like whether they provide something like that or encourage them to do that. 
but but like just for me to understand that, that does that really solve the problem because like the problem i see for example now is you have a specific load of tests that you want to run on a specific hardware if you want to do that now on like open simulators doesn't it make the problem harder because like an open simulator is probably a lot more expensive than having like a specific board and so don't you need then for like testing more loads, more open simulators, or do I get the problem incorrectly? Define expensive. Uh, it's uh, if if I get only one or two prototypes made by the company, uh, I guess the software approach is better, regardless of the performance. Uh, I, I can just m make thousands of them with common hardware. And it may run slower, but as long as the timing constraints are the same and uh, the stuff I'm testing is within that. And the, the, pro the real problem is, does my hardware comply with my spec and does the software respect the spec? That's what I care about. And the rest doesn't really matter. You can just not simulate the actually functional part uh, until you need to test them. So if you are testing only if the hardware initial is correctly, and that's all that matters for that test, you don't run the rest. So, so I think one, one of the issues is proving that the simulator is actually modeled exactly the way your uh, platforms are. And, and it has been a complicated issue, right? How, how much you can rely on your test result, let's say it's passing or failing, you know, how much you can claim that in real life it's actually passing and claiming or failing, right? And so at, in our experience, that, that was one issue that to look at, right? How do you qualify the simulator enough uh, to be able to say, well, now, you know, people take it and run it and you can rely it just like you were running on the real hardware? Uh. In, in my case, uh, the simulator was the reference, so mm -hmm. it didn't matter. But if you had the opposite uh, approach, uh, you can just add the bugs to, I mean, if they are hardware bugs, you add the bugs to the simulator one by one. I mean, that, that's the only, only way forward. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so th this, uh, just meet you just a moment. So. Yeah, the simulators are simulators for a reason, right? They, are, they don't match the hardware necessarily exactly, or you know, they cost a lot or whatever. But for certain loads on certain tests, they could be useful. So this is, might be something to look at to expand the lab, provided like we have sponsorship from Azure or something to run these loads, perhaps. Yeah, yeah have big plus one for this idea of right, providing simulators. Uh, I, they may be slower, but uh, common x86 ARM64 virtual machines are relatively cheap and it's easy to scale. And more importantly, uh, those, then those tests can be run locally by anyone, which is super useful. Uh, this will also allow to say run fuzzing on that hardware effectively. And the issue of bugs, uh, it shouldn't be a big issue because if you have, say, falsely a failing test, then it either means bug in the in your driver or in the simulator. So either way, it's something to fix. You just say file a bug on the driver or on the simulator. Uh, and uh, the situation that the tests pass falsely is very unlikely unless you specifically try to kind of fake things because the simulator needs to reply in very specific ways, so it's quite unlikely that the test will pass on the simulator only. Uh, does uh, his uh, does the hand to respond to you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the problem with is that the person who is running the simulation to qualify their software, if the problem is inside of the simulator, first of all, they have no idea, right? So how do they know if it's their problem or, you know, or the software problem? And so without getting to the actual hardware running and confirming it, they wouldn't, wouldn't know. But again, I, I agree with 
uh, Nikolai, I mean, there will be probably some cases, some, uh, some verifications that, you know, you could run the simulator and, and, and get some value out of it. And as, as I said, it's up to maintainer to select the hardware. Yeah. So it's up to them to decide. I, I think that's a bare problem to have. Uh, the second thing is if you have a spec, either the simulator is not uh, complying, uh, com compliant with the spec, which is something we could statically analyze. And the other problem, which actually, not, not a problem, it's a feature actually, is you discover hardware bugs, which are impossible to discover otherwise. You may be doing something actually wrong in software because of a hardware bug. And you only realize that when you get another hardware implementation of the same thing. And this prevents that. Yeah, I, all I'm saying is the company who provides the hardware will have to provide the simulator that matches to their hardware 100%, and it's a very difficult task. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, that, that usually doesn't happen. <laughs> and you have to keep updating it. Yeah. Generally speaking, once we get hardware, we don't care about the simulator anymore because we have hardware. So uh, there, there are some people from vendors here. So how nervous would they be about sharing those simulators, because I think that uh, details of their hardware are encoded in those simulators. No way? Yeah. Can we share the microphone first? Yeah. I mean, we do certainly have simulators for the hardware we build. I mean, that's like, especially if you want to build firmware before the, hard, before the hardware is really ready, you need that. So there is, we always have that, but I, like, this is, well, this is my personal opinion, but I don't see the company sharing those simulators ever with anybody else. This is just the IP, like, this is just an IP question. So it's, it's, that's a very difficult discussion, I think. Yeah, from my point of view. Like. What about if they just if they got integrated and ran the tests themselves on the simulator, right? Like I'm just just as an idea, right? I I don't know if it's really practical. Yeah, they but, keep I mean, the simulator instances on their premises, right? Uh, the question is, can you escape the simulator? Probably not. I mean, I'm not. I'm not really qualified to answer those questions. If the company would be good with that, I'm like maybe I like I I don't know. But it's also the. I mean, simulation is also very slow to some degree. Like we're talking magnitudes, like in some cases yeah, slower than emulation. Like it's really slow in some cases. So I'm not I'm not sure if they're willing to share the limited. Like we only have a, a, a limited amount of time on those simulators for our own stuff. So it's, yep. it's going to be a hard discussion sharing that time with somebody else running on our simulators. So, so there's different yeah. kinds of simulators. Some of them can run on regular desktop machines, but they are very slow. And yeah. that goes up like closer to the hardware, up to FPGA, which are fast, but very limited in availability. And then um, regarding the security, Red Hat gets a vendor hardware which they don't want us to talk about it, that it even exists. So like how the vendors would be comfortable with sharing it with the entire world that, that it, it's running, it's available in the kernel CI even before they have that hardware. So that, that's even like, that's even like, yeah, I mean like at all, it would only be possible after the hardware is available, and like the other way around. And it's, it's, and it's, it's been not, it's been properly yeah. through the PR machine. And yeah, everything. I mean, like, yeah, but like that's what well, that's a no go anyway. But yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's an interesting idea. Maybe somebody will be brave enough for some open source hardware maintainers or the yeah, developers. it would be cool, definitely. I mean, yeah. I maybe know. maybe the open source hardware that could happen. I think 
for these sorts of things, it's always important to think about what is the goal that's being achieved with using these simulators, right? Yeah, there are multiple different kinds of simulators. You've got the cycle accurate simulators that are ghastly slow. You've got something that's closer to QMU. Um, and I'll note that in the early days, in general, the hardware vendor is interested in just simply getting the box running. Right? And so presumably the people who will have access are people who are writing the BIOS, people who are writing the device drivers to enable that hardware. They're probably under NDA and may very well be getting paid you know, through some sort of contract with Red Hat or Calabra to do that early Linux bring up. And those people will have access and they will probably be really focused on just can I get the thing to boot? Which I suspect is a little bit too early for KCI in any case, right? And I would expect that by the time you get hardware, we can talk about whether it's DVT hardware or EVT hardware or PVT hardware, which you know, will get progressively more available. At some point, um, when the hardware vendor is even willing to disclose that this sort of stuff is available, then the open source people will have access to that, right? I mean, I worked with uh, folks at IBM who were working on the Power 7 architecture before it was released. They were in the Linux Technology Center. They had early access. Um, and they actually were able to do something really cool, which was on the day that the chips were announced, like the Linux kernel drivers were ready because they had early access. But, you know, I suspect that's a little bit out of scope for what we're probably going to be primarily trying to achieve with KCI. And you know, I suspect the hardware vendors who want that, who want early Linux bring up, will be able to reach out to the companies who are doing that work. So. <laughs> no more time. Oh. Okay, guys, uh, we run out of time. We can continue in the corridor. There's already people queuing up for the next thing. So let's get moving. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.